We want gold, don't we? And, and what do you do with gold to get the best gold possible? You have to refine it. It has to go through that process. It goes into that crucible. And only then is it refined and purified and its greatest value is developed through that process. Your faith is more valuable than gold. And of course, for God, gold means nothing. It's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a metal. It means absolutely nothing. Your, your faith is what means something to God. And listen, and this really struck me this week. It's the genuineness of our faith that God is wanting to bring out. You know, God wants us to have real faith, not fake faith. He wants us to have genuine faith. And so he's going to allow us to be tried to test the genuineness of our faith. Is it real? Am I just believing in God because it's the easier thing to do? Am I just believing in God because, well, you know, I figured if I did, I would, um, you know, it would kind of result in some prosperity and things like that. It's, you know, it's astounding some of the things that people have as their motivation for putting their trust in the Lord. And a lot of times you realize that they had the wrong motivation because when challenging times come, when trials come, immediately they are ready to check out. They say, well, hey, I didn't sign up for this, you know. This isn't what I was bargaining for when I came to the Lord. Well, this is the reality. If you thought it was you were going to get rich or you were going to be successful or you're going to get famous or something like that, those are all misconceptions that people can have. You're going to get your sins forgiven and you're going to get to go to heaven and God's going to bless you in many other ways uh, through the process, but you're also going to get your faith refined and the genuineness of it is going to be brought out. And so, you know, it, it's... God's not looking for fair weather followers, people that are just along for the ride as long as the ride is smooth. But the Lord wants us to follow him even through the challenging times, even through the difficult times, because there's something coming on the other side. And again, this is where we have to keep looking. You know, as I read this verse the other day, and then immediately my mind went to Moses. And I thought about Moses, what it said about him in Hebrews chapter 11 there. It says this, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. Moses chose a life of suffering. Moses, you know the story. Moses was, uh, you know, to some extent, he was the heir to the Egyptian throne. I mean, I don't know if he ever would have actually been the Pharaoh. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he might very well have been in line to be the Pharaoh. But, you know, maybe not. But whether he was the Pharaoh or not, he had a, a very significant and prestigious position in Egypt. But Moses chose suffering with the people of God over the position in Egypt. He chose to suffer affliction. Man, I thought about that. And I thought about the life of Moses, you know. And, you know, Moses had a rough time. He had a couple of million crybabies <laughs> that he had to tend to, you know. I mean, I get a few people griping at me and complaining to me, and it's just like, you know, <laughs> I just don't, oh, Lord, come on, I didn't sign up for this, you know. But... I mean, this was the life of Moses, basically. And he chose it. He chose to suffer affliction. Why? It says because he looked to the reward. He looked beyond this life. He knew that this was a temporary situation, and he knew that there was an eternity ahead of him. And so, there is that, that purification, that, that testing, just as gold is tried so our faith is being tested for its genuineness. Now, that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking about this. We can't even comprehend this. 
this is going to be the most unbelievable scene. You know, I mean, I don't know. We're, we're guys, so let's think of it in terms of sports. You know, you win the Super Bowl. Or you win the NBA playoffs. Or, you know, I mean, you see these guys. We've all watched the games, you know, or you win the heavyweight championship or whatever the case. And, you know, the excitement and the thrill and all that that's going on. And, you know, it was a, you know, the Lakers, they won the playoffs, you know, and they're, you know, they're there with the trophy and they're hugging it, you know, and all of that. And, I mean, that's pretty bizarre, you know. But, you know, they're just so into it. And all of the multitudes of people that come out and celebrate, this is nothing. It's absolutely nothing compared to this day that's being talked about here. Where the faith of every person is going to be found, having been tried, it's going to be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nobody's going to ask who the heavyweight champion was on that day. Nobody's going to care who won the Super Bowl ever. That's not going to be the issue. The issue is faith in Jesus Christ and who believed in him, who trusted him, who persevered through the challenging times, having their eye on eternity. There, there's a day coming, guys, and we're all going to be there. We're all going to be there. It's inevitable. There's no escape. We're all going to be there. And our faith is either going to be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, or it's going to be found wanting lacking and we certainly don't want to be in that category do we so speaking of jesus he says in verse 8 whom having not seen you love now peter of course had seen the lord but he's talking to people that had never seen him he's talking to people like us we've never seen jesus we haven't walked with him in the sense that they did we haven't touched him we haven't sat next to him and you know heard his uh, voice or had his hand on our shoulder or whatever the case might be but in another sense we have certainly met him haven't we we've had an experience with him we have a relationship with him and um, we love him because he first loved us whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, I have to confess that that is not my state of mind a lot of the times. But I also have to admit that it's not my state of mind probably because I so often have my mind on other things instead of on the Lord. You ever get to that place where you just feel like, man, Lord, I just, I'm just so clueless. You know, you're so great. You're so awesome. You're so wonderful. You're so, you're so all of those things, but I'm just so dumb and so dull and so hard-hearted. God, what, you know, sometimes I just feel just completely lame spiritually. I can't give God the praise and the honor and the glory that's really due him. It's, you know, I'm, I just feel I'm, I'm limited in my, even in my ability to do that. But I think as, as we just give ourselves over to the Lord and as we, as we, you know, really spend more time focusing on him. I mean, we are pressed for time these days, aren't we? It's just crazy. The schedule that most of us keep, it's just a crazy schedule. And, you know, I've got it way better than a lot of you guys because I spend most of my time doing things that revolve around the word and the ministry and all that, but I still find myself at times feeling like, Lord, I don't even have any time with you. I got a bunch of time doing stuff for you, but I don't have time with you. And because I don't have time with him, I end up not having that, uh, that joy that is being talked about here. But then I find, too, when I make the time, when I say, okay, you know what? I am not going to do that right now. I'm not going to let that distract me right now. I am going to just sit here and meditate on the Lord. I'm just going to think about him. I'm just going to praise him. I find, for me, that makes a huge difference. 
in my heart. And I start to come closer to that kind of experience that Peter is describing here. Rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them, listen to this, to them, the prophets, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. Man, think about that. The prophets, I mean, sometimes we look back and at the prophets and we, we envy them, but here Peter's telling us that it was told to them, oh, the things you're talking about, they're not for you, they're for the people coming in the future. I mean, you know, it's like, wait, we, we want some of that too. But it wasn't for them. Of course, they would ultimately partake in it, but they were, they were talking about the things to come. But the prophets, they, they searched I like what he says here. They searched what or what manner of time. They were searching these things out. This was something that intrigued them. This was something that they were, they were deeply interested in. This was something that they wanted to know. What or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating. So they, they were searching these things out. And I want to say this too. I think that that's, uh, that's a key to what we're talking about here. A key to experiencing the victory. A key to um, having that, that joy that he described there. That key to persevering through the challenging times and the the difficulties when our faith is being purified is that we keep seeking the Lord. We, we go deeper. We search uh, for him with uh, a greater intensity. You know, sometimes when the difficulties come, our tendency is to back away from the Lord, or to become upset or bitter, angry, and, and kind of, you know, sort of push the Lord away. No, the opposite is what we need to do. We need to, to dig in. We need to go deeper. Searching out, wanting to know, uh, desiring to understand, not necessarily the situation I'm in, but, you know, to just understand Christ himself. Because the more we just understand the Lord, like I said last week, you know, there are, there are some people who have and are presently and will, they will suffer their entire life with very little relief in in one sense. You know, I've read so many stories of um, those living under communism or, you know, other kinds of oppressive regimes where they've spent decades in prison only to be released uh, for a few days and then to die because they, you know, I mean, they just basically spent their entire lives in a prison cell. But they kept searching for Christ. And no doubt they kept finding him while they were there. And the Lord would meet them in those times. And Peter is going to say at one point, and I love this here in the epistle, he's going to talk about those who are suffering for their faith. He says that there is a unique thing that happens with them. The spirit of glory and God rest upon them. So they might never get out of the particular predicament they're in physically, but the Lord meets them in that thing. But then when we're in those times, you know, it's really at the end, you find that people who have, who, who have really gone through it, you'll find that the amazing thing is when they've really met the Lord in the, in the midst of their affliction, they will say in all sincerity, I would rather keep the affliction to know the Lord like I know him now than not have the affliction and lose what I've got with the Lord. 
because it's the Lord himself. He's the one who satisfies us. He's the one who just, you know, coming to know and experience him. And that's the prophets, of course. One of the things about the prophets we have to remember is that they suffered. They were not popular. They were not well treated. They were despised. They were hated. They were persecuted. They were slaughtered. But the Spirit of Christ was upon them, and the Lord met them in those times. So to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and listen to this, things which angels desire to look into. Now this is absolutely astounding. Salvation that we have, that we often, sadly, take for granted, is something that is so fascinating. It's such a marvel that angels desire to look into it. Angels are puzzled. Angels are baffled. Angels want to know this, this mystery. It's something that intrigues them. It's something that that draws them in to want to really understand this thing called the church and this relationship that God has with human beings, a relationship that is superior to the relationship that he has with angels. Isn't that astounding? We think of the angels quite often as uh, superior to us. Well, they are in power superior to us. But remember what the scripture says, Concerning God himself, he did not take upon himself the seed of angels, but he took upon himself the seed of Abraham. He did not become an angel, he became a man. And the great connection is not between God and the angels, as glorious as that is, the great connection is between God and human beings, because God became a man. And so this is something that's so marvelous that the angels desire to look into it. And I'm going to close with that tonight. We'll pick up in uh, verse 13 next week. But this is the one thing that I'd, I'd leave you guys with. And it's just the thought of the greatness of our salvation and the greatness of our Savior. And that's a theme that I want to, to think on frequently. You know, I like, to, I like to think about what it says in Hebrews chapter 1 about the Lord Jesus. It, it refers to him there as the creator. Well, first of all, it refers to him as the heir of all things, the creator of all things, and the sustainer of all things. And, you know, just think about that. Think about the implications of that. He is the heir of all things. Everything belongs to Christ. Everything that there is belongs to Jesus Christ because he made everything. He made it all. He is the heir. He is the creator. And he's the sustainer. He's the one who holds it all together. He literally holds the universe together. He literally holds your life together and my life together. And you know, when you, you get that in your head as something to meditate on, something to, to think about, it will put you in a place of being filled with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. I just, you know, just finding out little uh, tidbits of information here and there about, um, you know, just the, the intricacies of creation. And then to think, man, the Lord, Jesus, he's the one who made all of this stuff. It just, it does something to you. It just lifts you up and, you know, it'll, it'll pull you out of a pit. So I just would encourage you guys to think on the Lord. Realize that we've got something so marvelous that the angels are dying to look into it, and we've got it. It's there for us. It's available to us. And don't let the challenges and the difficulties and the trials and the suffering, don't let those things be a stumbling block to you where you would sort of back away from the Lord, but just say, Lord, I embrace this so you can do 
that deeper work in me that you want to do because that's exactly